Few would have considered it a silent night, a holy night. Travelers jostled in the city gates. Weary fists pounded on closed doors, pleading on the outside, arguing from within, all to the same refrain, no room. Among the houses rang raucous Roman laughter, census takers with comfortable quarters, and plenty of food and wine. There is little peace and less goodwill between stranger and villager here. Somewhere a dog barked, a lamb bleated, a woman moaned, and a baby cried. Out on the hillsides, exposed to the cold night, without even a stable for warmth, shepherds huddled around the fire, guarding their flocks against thieves and wolves. Suddenly, a light to split the darkness, a voice, a song, a chorus of angels. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a child, a son, a shepherd, a king, a savior which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Awaken, O little town that cannot sleep. Hear the shepherd's words. The angel's message. And arise to a sound unfamiliar. The triumph of joy. Welcome, church. Thank you for tuning in on these many platforms that we have uh, so we could do church together. Uh, today is the day that the Lord has made. And his word says, let us rejoice and be glad in it. So you might be watching us in your couch or just listening to us and while you cook something in the kitchen. By all means, why don't we, you gather your family and let us worship together this morning.
less of me and more of you Oh, I just want to see you
At this time during our broadcast, we would like to pause for a moment and give you an opportunity to share God's blessings uh, with uh, our church, the needs of the body, and also to continue to minister the word of God. We appreciate all of you who are giving and are being faithful to doing what God has called you to do in the area of worship, as far as I'm concerned, and in, in giving to the Lord. I believe it is an act of worshiping God. It is not a side note. I believe it is an integral part of a church service and of our offerings to the Lord. What I'd like to do is read a portion of scripture that the Apostle Paul has written in the Second Corinthians, the letter he wrote to Corinth. And this is in verse, in chapter 9, beginning in verse 5. It says, so I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, that the same might be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In this portion of scripture that Paul speaks about, I'm seeing what I believe is intentionality. I believe giving is all about being intentional in the way you are offering a gift to the Lord. And I think that it's important that we do that and purpose in our heart to give unto him what he calls us to. Be it a, you give a tithe, an offering, and even a sacrifice above and beyond. Whatever you give to the Lord, do it purposefully. Do it intentionally. And I believe God will bless you mightily. You have a lot of different ways that you can do that through online or you can send a physical check as well to the church. We leave that up to you. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon this offering time. Father, we thank you. This is the time that we worship you through our giving, through our offering that we give to you as we purpose in our hearts to give you a gift, a sacrifice, an offering for the work of the ministry so that we may continue to serve you and to give forth the truth of the word of God where you have placed our church in this community to the hearts and the lives of the people. May each person give with a heart filled with love for you and may you bless them in return for their sacrificial offering and giving to you. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much.
I've had some incredible days in my life, defining moments. We all have them. The day that Robin and I got married, the day when our kids, Christopher, Gina, and Alyssa were born, the day when our son, Christopher, got married, and most recently, the day when our little granddaughter, Annie, was born. But there is a day from a long, long time ago that is set apart from them all. It's the day when Jesus changed my life. I've never been the same since. Take me by the hand and walk with me by quiet street. He met me where I was, and he made his home in my heart. I need to hear the wind and feel the ground beneath my feet. And a day hasn't gone by since then where he hasn't been with me, he's walked with me every step of the way. Cause you're the only friend who can set my soul free. He set me free. He gave me freedom from my past. And in the quiet pride of my father's eyes, I remember who He reminds I me am. every day of who I am and in him. Jesus came to set you free. He came to free you from your past. Free from guilt. Free from shame. Free from regret. 
free from feeling like you have been less than you could have or should have been. He came to set you free from the pain of what you have done to others or what others have done to you. Free from wrong turns and bad decisions. He came to unlock the chains that have bound you up and held you down and trapped you and suffocated you. Jesus came to free you from your past. And the prophet Isaiah, and this was hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came to earth, he wrote something which was a prophecy of what was to come. And Jesus, when he came on the scene, he opened up the scrolls in the temple and he read from this. And when he finished reading this, he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. And it says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to bestow on them a crown of beauty, listen, instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You can be free. You can be free. I will never forget that day. I will never forget the day that Jesus set me free. That song that you heard a few moments ago brought me right back to that day, those many years ago, 40 years ago, 40 years ago when Jesus changed my life. I prayed a prayer. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. I had been in an epic struggle for quite some time, a struggle for control. Was I going to be in control? Or was I going to surrender control of my life to him? And then that day on November 2nd, 1980, the dam broke, and I prayed, Jesus, I've had enough. Those were the exact words. I've had enough. I don't want to live life on my own anymore. Come into my life. Take control. Forgive me and set me free and put me on a new path in my life. Come into my heart and be with me from this day forward. And five hours later, I woke up as I had to head to class for one of my college classes. And I woke up a different person. I was born again. The Spirit of God got hold of me, and he has never let me go since. And freedom isn't a one-time thing. It's an everyday thing. He has set me free, and he is setting me free every day, each and every day that I'm alive. I don't need to live in fear. I don't need to live in regret. I don't need to be looking in the rearview mirror anymore. I don't need to rewind the tape and punish myself. Would have, could have, should have. What are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? Let it go. Let it go. In Jesus' name. I love Psalm 103. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of your sins. 
and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm much older now, but I feel more alive than I've ever been. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And that fear is not a, it's not a cowering fear. It's not a, you know, it's, a, it's an awe. It's a reverence for who God is. So great is his love for those who, who revere him, who are in awe of him. As far as the east is from the west, like the Casting Crown song says, one scarred hand to another. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thank God. Jesus came to free you from your past. And the only way that you live, truly live, is if you live in the redemption that is yours in Jesus Christ. Corey Tamboom, she was an incredible, incredible Christian saint who suffered at the hands of the Nazis. Most of her family perished in Nazi prison camps, but she survived miraculously. And she wrote, when you look to the world, you will be distressed. And boy, isn't that true. When you look to the world and you look at what's going on around you, it's so easy to be distressed. When you look to the world, you will be distressed. And when you look within you, you will be depressed. But when you look to Christ, you will be at rest. Hmm. Reminds me of the old hymn. There's an old hymn entitled, And Can It Be? We sang it here many, many years ago. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me? Who caused his pain? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? <laughs> this is what happened to the Apostle Paul. We talk about him a lot here. You know, he was, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a, a Pharisee, a, a fanatical Jewish religious leader, followed all the laws, was perfect in everything. And then when Christi Christianity came on the scene, he tried to wipe it out, to stamp it out. He dragged Christians off into, into prison. He was complicit in the death of Stephen, one of the first martyrs, I think the first martyr in the Christian church. He held the, the cloaks, the, 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 the jackets of the people who were stoning Stephen to death. And then he met Christ on a road one day. Christ appeared to him and changed his life. And he became Paul. He went from Saul to Paul. He got a new name and he started churches everywhere. And he writes in 1 Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was those things. Those things are in my past. Even though I was those things, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I, I didn't know what I was doing. Jesus prayed while he was being nailed to a cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Don't judge people. Pray for them. Pray that God will open their eyes. I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Listen, Christ Jesus 
came into the world to save sinners, of whom I, Paul, formerly Saul, am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. In other words, if Christ Jesus can forgive me in light of all that I've done, he can forgive anyone. I'm his example. Jesus came to set you free. So how do you live in this reality? How, how can you be set free from your past? I would submit today that there are three things that, that you have to do. And the first is this. Let God love you. Let him love you. Let him free you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Let God love you. One of, the, one of the saddest verses in the New Testament is found in the Gospel of Luke. And the setting to this verse is, is that Jesus was getting ready to enter into Jerusalem for the last time. You know, the triumphal entry where they were going to put, you know, palm branches on the road and, and cry out, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And then a few days later, they were going to yell, crucify him, crucify him. All of that is about to happen. And, and he knows it. Jesus was born to die. That's why he came, to die for you and to die for me and ultimately to rise again. And it says, as he approached Jerusalem and as he saw the city, he sees the, the city from a distance. It says he wept over it. There are only two places in the New Testament that I'm aware of where, where it shows that, says that Jesus wept. He cried. The first was the death of Lazarus. You all know that story. Lazarus died, and, and Jesus comes on the scene, and, and everybody's crying. His sisters are crying. His friends are crying. And it says Jesus wept. And he wasn't weeping because Lazarus died because he knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. He was weeping because he saw the pain that death causes in the lives of those who are left behind. The Bible says that the last enemy is death. And Jesus even has victory over that. But he wept over it, wept over their weeping. When my dad died, I, shortly after I committed my life to Christ, shortly after he transformed me within a year, I lost my dad. I was young. And there were three words that, that kept, got me through that, and they were, and Jesus wept. And that was from the story of Lazarus. And here's another place where he's weeping. He's approaching Jerusalem, he sees the city, and it says he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes, if you only knew. If you only let me love you, it breaks God's heart when you don't let him love you. Let him love you. For God so loved the world that he gave. He wants to give that to you. There's a story in Luke chapter 7. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to put it, put it up on the screen, but there's a story in Luke chapter 7 about a woman. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned 
that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came with an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and then she wiped them with her hair. Imagine that she was weeping and her tears wet his feet. That's how much she was crying. And then she wiped his feet, wet from her tears with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. And then Jesus ultimately turned toward the woman and toward the Pharisee and said to him, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you didn't give me any water for my feet and she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil in my, on my head, and, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Whatever she had done, and you could use your imagination, whatever she had done, whatever weight she was carrying, guilt, regret, shame, was forgiven. She let God love her, and she loved him back. Let God love you. Receive his love. Soak in his love and let him free you from your past. It will change your life. It'll change your life. In John chapter 13, you know the story where, where Jesus uh, washed his disciples' feet one by one. And he got to Peter and, 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 and Peter said, no, you'll, you'll never wash my feet, Lord. And, and Jesus said, unless I wash you, Unless you let me love you, you'll have no part with me. And Peter said then, my head and my hands as well. Then God, I want it all. I want it all. If you want to be free from your past, you have to let God forgive you, free you, and love you. Accept his love <clears throat> as a free gift. Can't earn it. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. Let him love you. And the second thing, if you want freedom, you truly want freedom from your past, is you need to forgive and love yourself. Forgive and love yourself. One day, uh, uh, a man came up to Jesus and he said, Lord, there's a lot of stuff in here. There are a lot of laws and requirements. What's the most important thing? And Jesus said, here's the most important thing. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Broken people. Broken people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. 
People who don't love themselves, who don't feel self-worth, don't demonstrate worth toward others. And Jesus is saying, love other people the way you should love yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to be empathetic with yourself. You have to forgive yourself. The Bible says we love because he first loved us. And if God has forgiven you, listen to me very closely, you need to forgive yourself. You need to forgive yourself. Is it possible to ask God to forgive you and believe that he has, <clears throat> but not forgive yourself? Absolutely yes. You know how I know? Because I've done that more times than I care to admit. You know, I can know if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. I can know the verse, I can know the verses, and I can ask for forgiveness and even believe on one level that God has forgiven me and yet still carry that thing, still carry that cross of whatever that thing was and not forgive myself. But if God has forgiven me, and he has, if I'm sincere, I need to forgive myself. And if God loves me as much as the Bible tells me that he does, and I know experientially that he does, then I have to learn to love and value myself as a human being. You will not experience freedom, real freedom, unless you forgive yourself and learn to love yourself. Let God love you. Let him love you and learn how to love yourself because he loves you so much. Then let it go. And let it go. Whatever it is, let it go and walk in the grace and the mercy and the love of God. I mean, how did these people do it? Moses was a murderer. Jacob was a deceiver. David was an adulterer. You know? Peter denied Jesus three times. Paul, you know, threw Christians into prison and was complicit in murder himself. How did they get on with their lives and do the things that they did and be so used by God because they let God forgive them and love them. And they learned in light of that how to begin to love themselves, created in the image of God. So number one is let God forgive you. Let him love you. And then learn how to forgive yourself and, and learn how to love yourself in a healthy way, a healthy love, because of your worth in God, because he loves you. And then number three is this. Rinse, lather, repeat. Rinse, lather, repeat. Rinse, lather, repeat. You just keep doing that over and over and over again. Let God love you. Let him forgive you. Let him free you. And then forgive and love yourself. You know, as I've gotten older, I've learned how to do this more quickly. You know, I used to, uh, <clears throat> I used to feel like uh, I had to carry things for a while. So let me, let me suffer in my own self-disappointment and regret 
and sometimes shame for the things that I said or the things that I did. And then after I suffered enough, then I would confess whatever it was to God. And then after that, I might hold on to it a little bit more and just feel bad about it. And you know what I found? I found that that brought me nothing but pain and misery. And so now, everything happens much more quickly for me. When I fall short, when I hurt someone, when I say something that I shouldn't say, when I do something that I shouldn't do, as soon as the Holy Spirit quickens that to me in my spirit, and I know, I immediately confess it. I confess it. And then I leave it there. And I forgive myself. And I move on. And I walk in freedom again. Why? Because of the grace of God in my life. Let God love you and learn how to forgive and love yourself and move on and move forward. Next week, we're going to be talking about, about power in the present. Power for the present in your life. But you can't live in the power of the present if you are in bondage and slavery to the past. <clears throat> Jesus came to set you free. I need to be free from your past to have power in the present and then ultimately hope for the future. Galatians 5.1 says this, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. How much clearer can God be? Christ came to set you free, free from your past. What do you need to be freed from? What it has had its, its clutches on you. You haven't been able to shake it. You haven't been able to let it go. It might be something that happened years ago to you or something that you did years ago to somebody else or to yourself and you're still carrying it today. You need to let it go. Let it go. And let God love you. I learn how to forgive and love yourself. Because here's the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Here's the truth. You are only as free as you want to be. You're only as free as you choose to be. Jesus offers it to you, but you need to accept the gift, the gift of his freedom, the gift of his forgiveness. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Have you been carrying stuff that you shouldn't be carrying? Way, way too long. Much longer than you needed to. He says, come to me if you're burdened, and I will give you rest. But you have to come to me. You're only as free as you want to be and you choose to be. You have to come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, there's the word, rest. Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I will never, ever forget that day so many years ago when he set me free 
And he set me on a journey. Set me on a journey, and it's been a day by day by day by day walk. Learning how to let God love me and give me the ability to walk in freedom and the ability to forgive and love myself so that I can truly love you and love the people who are most important to me in my life. I want that for you as well. So I'm going to extend an invitation to you. And some of you are, are listening to this and watching this right on time during our time of our worship service. And some of you it might be some time after that. And you might be watching this right now. And it might be weeks or months or who knows when after this this little talk was given, and you clicked on the website, and you're watching this message. Well, you know what? God knows. And God ordained this moment, this very moment, for you, because he transcends time. It doesn't matter if it's live. It doesn't matter if it's taped. It doesn't matter. Right now, the Holy Spirit is at work in you, and he's inviting you. He's inviting you to come to Jesus. He's inviting you to surrender your life to him and to be free from your past. Some of you right now, maybe you've never made that decision. But you're right there. You're right at the edge. And you feel something going on. And that's the Holy Spirit of God at work in your heart and in your life. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will let me in, I will come into him. And I will dine with him and live with him and, and he or she with me. He's knocking. And he's saying, let me in. And let me set you free. And so I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to ask you, to pray a prayer like I prayed so many years ago that set me free. I was literally born all over again on the inside. A new course, new life, new trajectory, new hope, new vision. And maybe you've been at this for a while and you've been on the journey, but you've been holding on to stuff that you simply should not be holding on to. And I'm going to invite you to lay it down and let God free you from that, whatever it is, or those things, once and for all. And let God love you and forgive and learn how to love yourself. So I'm going to ask you, wherever you are, whoever you are, to close your eyes and to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And I ask you, to free me from my past. Jesus, I, I realize, I recognize what you have done for me on the cross. You shed your blood for me so that my sins can be washed away, forgiven, so that I can have a fresh start in my life. And God, I never want to live my life alone again. I want you in it. So I surrender my life to you. Make your home in my heart. Set me free and set me on a new path, on a new journey and a journey with you. I receive this. 
I believe this. I accept this. In your name, Jesus. And my life belongs to you. Thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been so great to be with you. It's our hope and our prayer that this service has been a source of encouragement to you, that it has lifted and elevated your faith and your trust in God, God who loves you so much, who knows every detail of your life, who is in control. Keep the faith. We love you. And we'd like to leave you with a benediction this morning, with a blessing, which is, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and give you his favor and grant you his peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that will guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Good evening, my fellow bridge students. I'm so glad to uh, be able to come and speak to you today. It has been uh, quite a long time since we have been together. We have faced social, economic, and civil instability. All of this while in the middle of a pervasive pandemic. In our church, we have seen many transitions. And to be honest with you, we do not know when things will be going back to normal. However, I bring to you a message of hope. In the book of Hebrews, we are told to not forsake the gathering of saints. That means you. So I'm so happy to declassify some very classified information right now. Starting on January 10th, our church will be seeing a little bit of some normalcy. We uh, will be going back to having two services, one at 9.30 and 11.15. Now, what does that mean for you? More options to come to church, but something better. Ladies and gentlemen, while we are still in the middle of the pandemic, unfortunately, we cannot bring the mix back as of yet. But uh, what we can do is we can promise you that between the two services, from 10.45 to 11.15, we will meet together for our teen class right here in person at the church. So while I know you are tired of Zoom, you're Zoomed out, I understand. We will come together just like before. We will be able to speak to one another we may not be able to touch one another, but we can certainly speak and gather together and learn about what God is doing in your life. Uh, thank you, and good night. I'm Barack Obama, and I approve this message.